Welcome back to Human Behavior and Sustainable Development. This week, we're talking about evolution, behavior, and sustainability. This is part two of exploring the big question, what is evolution? In part one, we learned that we can think about evolution as changes in characteristics within complex adaptive systems. So more than simply changes in genes, we can think about evolution as including changes in uh, genes, bodies, brains, technology, knowledge, behaviors, social organization, biotic and even abiotic environments that are part of interacting systems. And we can look at this over generations of organisms, but also uh, even within the lifetime of an organism, including humans. So we learned that evolution can be all of these things that we can talk about, even learning as evolution or cultural change as evolution. But what does it mean? If evolution is all of these things, is it saying anything specific? How can we get a little more specific about the concepts that live within the concept of evolution? So let's look at what different scientists from different disciplines may think are the core ingredients for explaining something as evolutionary. A change in a population as an evolutionary change, many scientists will agree on a few different conceptual elements that must be there. And they'll often talk about these as mechanisms. So uh, for example, the first ingredient is that of variation. So a system must have some mechanism or some way that new variation of characteristics can emerge. So genes need mutations or sexual recombination to create new variants of, of genes. Uh, brains need different sources of information or experiences to learn from in order to create variation. And of course, course, culture may have many different mechanisms for introducing new variants, new different, different characteristics. So that's the first ingredient that everyone basically agrees is required to say something is evolving. Now, the second characteristic means that the population must have some mechanism for changing the frequency or the commonality of the characteristic. So uh, that means that there must be some way that this new variation could either increase in frequency, mean, meaning get more common, uh, so more people using cell phones or more uh, more butterflies that are better adapted to their environment, uh, anything that would increase or decrease the frequency. We can talk about that as sometimes you'll hear the term natural selection or just the idea of selection, uh, meaning what are the conditions that either favor or disfavor some of these variations within the system? And then also there's, of course, random processes, processes that uh, are just uh, uh, happening by accident, so to speak, that may also change whether a characteristic becomes more common or less common, whether it increases in frequency or decreases in frequency. Now, some scientists will say actually those first two principles, variation and change of frequency, that these are enough for evolution. And others suggest that there's one third ingredient and uh, that's needed. And this would be this, this idea of either inheritance or transmission, or sometimes uh, people will talk about retention or persistence of characteristics. So there needs to be some way for the characteristic, the variation, to be reproduced or reconstructed or just to stay in the system between one time period and the next. So. For organisms, this is genetic inheritance often uh, in the sense through sexual reproduction of, of an organism. In culture, this might be processes of teaching or copying. And 
Uh, and of course, in learning, this might be long-term memory uh, or, uh, or just the repetition of different behaviors. So we can see this in different ways. Now, how can, how can we help students to uh, think about how these different mechanisms might look very different across different phenomena? And this is where our approach of conceptual learning and learning transfer come in and one of the teaching tools from the global ESD design concept. So we suggest the use of analogy maps to help us compare different phenomena by comparing uh, common underlying principles and processes. So this helps us to develop a deeper understanding of concepts and the ability to transfer this understanding to new contexts. So here's a simple, uh, analogy map between genetic evolution and cultural evolution along these principles that we've just identified. Now, before I move on to the solutions, I'll highlight that you can do this in different ways in the classroom with 10th through 12th graders who've maybe had a little concept of evolution. We've given them just even blank sheets and, and uh, some uh, more advanced students may be able to begin to write um, their initial ideas. You can also do it as a sorting activity. So you can either print out these worksheets and have and cut out uh, the answers and allow students to uh, physically place them on a piece of paper. Uh, or I will show you now the H5P, the interactive activity uh, that's within our OpenEvo Moodle. So let's go over there. Here we are in the H5P analogy table activity for genetic and cultural evolution. Here you can see that the interface for the student or for yourself is fairly simple. There's a few questions. Through what mechanisms does variation of traits occur? Through what mechanisms does selection of traits occur? And through what mechanisms are traits inherited or transmitted or retained in the population? You've got your rows here for genetic and cultural evolution. And then you've got various answers to select from. So I won't go through this now, but we can see, for example, variation of traits in genetic evolution would probably be this mutations and recombination. We can put that there. If we have questions about any given uh, issue, we can any given uh, topic, we can get a tip. And so this is an, a, a digital media interactive method of doing this, but of course you can also do it in pen and paper. And so you can go to the Moodle, to the OpenEvo Moodle, and actually do this now if you want to uh, uh, test yourself and pause the video. And otherwise, I'll be going back to the video where we'll look at the answers quickly. So for genetic evolution, we're talking more about genetic mutations and recombinations as a source of variation. And selection is really just the higher chances of survival and reproduction. And traits are passed on through biological reproduction and in more technical terms, uh, meiosis or mitosis. Where in cultural evolution, when we're talking about variation, we're talking about things like creativity, innovations, the recombination of ideas, but also things like mistakes, reaction to new environments. These things are all cultural or behavioral phenomena that uh, can introduce cultural variation. And we can say selection is occurring when there's a higher chance of survival and reproduction of the cultural trait. So uh, is the trait, uh, it could be that it's helping the people who have the culture to survive and reproduce, but it could also be that the people are just actually keeping these cultural elements and reproducing them or re-engaging them over time. And this might be because there's a higher appeal of the trait. And how are these traits passed on or inherited? Well, through social learning, through imitation, teaching, uh, but also through, we can say these cultural traits can be retained within the system through technologies and infrastructure that just lasts. Uh, that if one piece of technology or if a book is just persistent in the environment, then that is a 
a source of cultural inheritance. And of course, there are other processes and principles which we can compare genetic evolution. So we can take the same analogy map comparison, but we could ask other questions like where is information stored or can organisms adapt during their lifetime? If we try to fill this out, we can see that for genetic evolution, of course, the information is largely stored in the genome. And many biologists would suggest that no organisms can't adapt during their lifetime because the genome in the germ cells does not change during the lifetime. Uh, they would say that only populations can adapt. Now, other biologists might say that, well, epigenetics or changes in gene regulation could be a form of genetic adaptation within the lifetime. So this is an area where, again, biologists may not always agree on, the mo on, on a basic concept. Um, as in cultural evolution, we can see that information is stored in brains or neural networks, but also social networks, and also in the environment through different kinds of structures, technologies, books. Of course, the internet is a massive storehouse of information. And of course, in cultural evolution, <clears throat> we can adapt uh, within our lifetime because organisms change their behavior uh, often uh, or their environment or create new things. And so cultural evolution can look at adaptation processes within and between the lifetime of individuals. If you download these slides, you can also look at, at these further links for resources. So what about this? What does it mean the, that cultural evolution can be driven by the higher appeal of a trait? Well, we can, have, we can think about the appeal of a trait in different ways. We may have a quite conscious or intentional uh, choice about some of the products that we make. We may feel that we're uh, generally rational, uh, conscious beings who are making uh, 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 in very intentional choices about, about what appeals to us. And, and there are elements that that's true for different cultural traits, such as be beliefs, behaviors, norms, traditions, knowledge, technologies, institutions, and social organization. Uh, however, there's also a lot of, of elements to these cultural traits that may be actually quite unconscious, quite uh, not intentional. And so in cultural evolution, we try to think about the the different levels and, and different ways in which both intentional and perhaps more blind processes are driving cultural change. So one of the ways that, uh, that humans drive cultural change or cultural evolution through less conscious or less intentional uh, and perhaps completely uh, unaware and unintentional ways is through, through these imitation biases. And so humans seem to have these imitation biases. We, uh, even from a very young age, we seem to be imitating those around us and we do it in reliable ways. So we might imitate the majority of people around you. We might imitate the most successful or prestigious, depending on whatever success might mean in a given context. We might imitate or adopt the trait or technology because of some attractive trait characteristic, like it makes life easier, or it's cheap, or it looks nice, or it's easier to learn, et cetera. And, uh, and we may also have personal preference, of course, right? What do I consider desirable plus the role of the social environment? What does my group consider desirable? So understanding that we have these both intentional, but also then these unintentional uh, uh, imitation biases can help us think about cultural change, possibly in relation to sustainability issues. For example, what does it mean if we understand these biases, could that be used to enhance the imitation or the spread of sustainable or preferred traits? Uh, is there a way to under, to use this understanding of human behavior to uh, nudge human behavior towards more cooperation and sustainability? This is an active area of scientific and educational discussion 
which obviously has ethical and practical uh, uh, complexity that that's worth discussing and something we'll discuss later in the module, but you can also link here in the slides. And we can also ask things like, how would a greater awareness of one's values uh, in relation to these biases perhaps change how we respond to these biases? So we can think about what are values, what is mindfulness in relation to how we go about uh, either engaging or perhaps shifting uh, how these imitation biases may, may shape our own behavior or those around us. Now, evolution can also be mapped analogically or, or compared to not just cultural evolution, but also the learning of behavior within individuals. And so here we can take our, our analogy map and we can think about learning, which is the process of acquiring new or modifying existing knowledge, behavior, skills, values, and preferences. And we can think about how would that compare to to the process of genetic evolution. So you can pause the video here if you want and go to the online interactive within this week's uh, OpenEvo Moodle and click on the H5P activity for analogy mapping between genetic evolution and learning. And then come back and we can see that we can explore how learning and behavior change within individuals and over development. It's like evolution in populations over generations. In fact, it is a change in populations of the neurons within our, within our brain. So think about how you would fill out these cells. And here's how we would answer. Variation in learning comes from unintended mistakes or errors. That's one way to learn things, trial and error, uh, but also through exploration, recombination of ideas, reaction to new environments, and social learning. These are all ways to get, uh, to engage in new variation within individual learning. Selection occurs in learning when the behavior is valued or leads to the achievement of a goal or not, and whether it's rewarding or not in some way and perhaps the degree to which it is similar or coherent with prior learning. So all learning is based on prior learning and to the degree that you might be relating something to what you currently know, that may favor the uh, increase in which you adopt and adapt that piece of understanding. And finally, how is learning, how are the traits of, of learning uh, uh, transmitted, or perhaps we would say retained within the mind. And this is done through encoding in the nervous system in, uh, in perhaps something we would call long-term memory so that the organism is more likely to do it again or think it again in the future. So this is just one more extension of these more specific, uh, uh, the specific surface level features of learning that we can begin to relate to these deeper principles, these higher level structures of knowledge about the nature of what we're talking about when we think about evolutionary change more generally. So before we go, I'd like to just highlight two common misconceptions about evolution. One is that evolution happens to organisms and that the role of the role of the individual to choose or the preferences uh, of an organism have a no role in evolution. And the second is that evolution is only about competition. So, and that ideas of cooperation or working within groups would not be part of evolution understanding. Let's look at this first one. Evolution does happen to organisms. Sometimes an organism may be eaten by a predator or uh, in other ways driven to extinction or, uh, or driven to, to success based on nothing that it has done uh, that any given organism has, has done uh, intentionally. Um, but it's not only based on that. In fact, organisms do also shape their own evolution through their behaviors, but there's an important caveat, 
an important point. So it's not that behaviors change genes directly, at least that's certainly not the normal situation. If it's a uh, if it's possible is something some scientists are discussing, but uh, but generally speaking, behaviors aren't directly changing our genes or evolving our genes. Uh, uh, but it's rather that organisms that have flexible behavior, fle organisms that are able to do different things within their own lifetime, uh, have ways of, of introducing new kinds of variation. These are behavioral changes or preferences of the organism, and this can affect their social or natural environment and therefore their evolutionary trajectory. So said another way, the behaviors of the of, the, of an organism may create the selection pressure uh, or the conditions that that then favor that trait into the future. In biology, these processes are called niche construction if it's an active process of changing the environment, or niche selection, if it's moving to a preferred environment. And these are cases in which the behavior, sometimes goal-directed or in humans, we might say intentional behavior, is actually creating conditions that may either increase or decrease behaviors in the future. And in humans especially, these processes may play a major role in our human origins and our current capacities for global cooperation. The second misconception is that evolution is only about competition and cooperation isn't at play. But that's not only true. Evolution is also about cooperation or about how individual entities come to be integrated together so that they do not compete fully, uh, but actually start working as a group or even start becoming new biological units with completely new traits, as we see in the evolutions of multicellularity. When we think about the about how to explain things like the complexity of genomes or eukaryotic cells, multicellular organisms, and group living species, if it was all about competition, we wouldn't see any of these, uh, of these incredibly cooperative biological organizations. And so in fact, life wouldn't even be able to get off the ground from simple independent competing molecules. If, if molecules, if these uh, early replicating proto-DNA molecules weren't able to functionally integrate or work together in some sense, then life would never have been able to get off the ground. So we see that actually evolution is just as much a science of cooperation and working together as it is about understanding the nature of competition. And importantly, because evolution is about cooperation and cooperation matters for sustainability, we can explore the importance and the challenges of cooperation for global sustainability. Uh, and that's something that we'll continue to do in the following units of the module. And so finally, we'll close with this note or a question, how is evolution relevant to sustainability? Answering this question probably depends on what your understanding about evolution and sustainability concepts are in the first place. So some different perspectives that we found people might have, like students might have on this question, could be the idea that it's not very relevant, that what happened in the past does not matter for addressing today's sustainability problems. Others might say something like it helps us understand how species will adapt to the changes in climate and ecosystems. Others might say something like, it helps us learn from nature and other species about how to be more sustainable. And others may say something to the effect of, it helps us understand our ancestors and how they lived sustainably. And so perhaps we should return to this more sustainable lifestyle. So some of these perspectives may be profitably, profitably related to scientific perspectives. For example, 
we can use evolution to understand how species might adapt to the future climate change. Uh, while others would be viewed more as more limited or inaccurate by many scientists. So the idea that we should live like our ancestors is certainly not something that's, uh, that's well agreed upon across scientists. So we can say that students and non-scientists, everyday people, often do have some view on, on how relevant or not sustainability may be, and we can think more clearly about how this might relate to scientific perspectives. Here's how we would answer the question. We would say that how our behavior and mind evolved over historical timescales uh, may tell us something about the challenges and opportunities for addressing sustainability problems today. But perhaps more, more precisely or, or, or more critically, we think that evolutionary processes, including evolution within brains and cultures, do not automatically lead to outcomes that we might prefer, such as well-being and sustainability. And so therefore, we think that understanding the processes through which our cultures, environments, behaviors, and minds continue to evolve allows us to shape our world towards a preferred future. So in the remainder of this module, we will explore some of our evolved behaviors and their importance to sustainability, both as challenges and opportunities, and some methods that behavioral and sustainability scientists explore to help humans move into a preferred direction. Mm -hmm.